Hey, welcome. I'm Bianca Hagen, host of the Mama Yogi Bear podcast. And today I'm here with my dear friend, Rachel Blyken. Hi, Rachel. Welcome to the show. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you here. Um, Rachel is a distinct guest for us, guys, because she was not only our very first uh, guest here on the Mama Yogi Bear podcast, but she's also our very first repeat guest. So we're honored to have yet another interesting conversation with her. Um, our first episode that we, we did was on conscious parenting. And uh, as I had explained in the episode, uh, Rachel introduced me to this beautiful world of conscious parenting. And uh, we met a few years back uh, over, I think, unschooling and forest schooling. Uh, we have a lot of similar interests and we lived really close to each other. So it was really great to meet another unschooling mom because it seems, it can seem that it's, there's so few of us, but when we meet other ones, it just, it makes, it makes the whole journey a lot more interesting and gives you more confidence to know that other people, highly educated people like Rachel are adopting this lifestyle as well after a lot of research, I'm sure. So Rachel, I will turn the microphone over to you. Uh, could you introduce yourself? Uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, what are you about? Um, how did you get to this point in unschooling? So just tell us a little bit about yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm a professional educator. I went to college for elementary ed and um, I got introduced to some of the concepts that um, behind unschooling at the time. And I was actually really disappointed when I went to my first year of student teaching and found that what I had learned in college wasn't being practiced in school. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so that was kind of a like light bulb moment for me. And uh, I decided to look for a private school. Um, so I found Waldorf education and it, I was working with early childhood at that point. So mm -hmm. yeah, that was a big um, shift for me in terms of understanding, you know, how children learn. And I hadn't majored in early childhood education at the time. So it was a little bit new for me in terms of that. But like, I definitely resonated with um, just letting the kids play and the sort of idea that like, we don't have to force anything on them. We don't have to teach them anything. They're gonna come to it on their own and discover it on their own. Um, and I think for early childhood, it's pretty natural to understand that. For most parents these days, they're like, oh yeah, my kids just need to play. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's an easier way to explain it, I guess. Um, so I found that when I, when I had started having kids, I opened a daycare. That's actually how we met. Because right. I think I, I think you saw something about forest outdoor play and you were like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's what I was doing for the first three years of my eldest child. Um, and then I did another year teaching kindergarten at the Waldorf school again. And I found going back after learning about unschooling that it wasn't quite as free as I wanted it to be. Um, even the Waldorf school. So I was like, wow, I've definitely learned a lot. And at, I'm now um, about to graduate from uh, uh, online grad school for master's in early childhood ed, because I was like, I want to do more research about this. Um, yeah. so I think after having learned what I've learned and going back to Waldorf, I, I realized that it's a lot more schooly and more controlled than I really wanted. So um, I decided, I was thinking at the time, like, maybe I'll, you know, take my kids to school with me. They can go to the Waldorf school and I'll keep teaching. And I was just like, nope, it's not working. It's not going to work. I just want to unschool them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it was kind of the deciding moment for me, like really going back and experiencing it again as a teacher. Um, so that's where I'm at now. My kids are four and a half and three. So mm -hmm. they're still super young, st still in the stages of just playing and we do outdoor play every day as much of the day as possible mm -hmm. um, yeah so that's kind of a little bit about me and uh my journey yeah that's no, interesting because i we have dabbled a lot in uh you know like the preschool stuff and i even took my daughter on a you know like a tour of the local elementary school uh but you know and also now i'm also kind of enrolling them in some math and reading classes which is part of like i guess my own de-schooling uh, process. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, 
I, I we've we've done that, and every time that we do these things, it, it just becomes so clear to me that they just learn so much better when they're just kind of on their own exploring the world around them, as opposed to me kind of forcing my own agenda on them, right? I mean, at first they love the classes and they're all excited. And then I just start seeing, you know, their interests kind of wane and just kind of, you know, they start getting a little frustrated and start asking like, why are we doing this? Why am I here? <laughs> you know, I could be playing, I could be doing other more interesting things with my day. Um, and I don't know if, if you've had similar experiences, uh, but uh, definitely as soon as they start entering a more structured uh, world, you know, and schedule, at least at this age, because my children are pretty young too. So six, five, and three, I definitely notice it kind of backfiring after a couple of weeks. I mean, is that a similar experience that you, you've had at all or with your Well, kids? we haven't done classes or anything like that. Yeah. Um, I, I'm definitely um, not one of those moms that thinks my kids need to know anything academic at this point. Um, so I've avoided that pitfall, but I, I definitely have felt unsure about, you know, should my child be able to write his name? You know, like he's four and a half. There's, you know, in the back of your mind, you have these like standards. In. Yeah. That like, I, especially as an, as a trained educator, like I have these standards in my head that are like, um, you know, they should be able to do X, Y, Z by this age or that age. And, and these are mm -hmm. like, made up benchmarks that I know are totally um, meaningless. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, they're still there and you still wonder about it. Um, and I just, um, I noticed that Rowan started writing things on his own. Like he just, he started uh, writing letters. Yeah. <laughs> I, I never taught him the letters, but when I saw him writing them, um, I was tempted to kind of, uh, facilitate in a way and like intervene with the way he was writing them because he was writing them the wrong way. <laughs> um, and so I don't know, I do think that the teacher comes out at times and whether that's good or bad or whatever, I don't know, but that's just kind of what happens. I'm like, oh, let's, let's do it like this. And he's receptive to it. I feel like as long as the child is receptive and he, and wants that feedback, then it's fine. It's when they start to push away and they're like, we don't want to do this or, you know, then it becomes a sort of battle of wills, like, right. you know, and sometimes there's factors, like if you sign them up for a class, you've paid money and then, you know, yeah. it's hard to know like what to do with that. Yeah. But I would say, yeah, like, I think sometimes for kids, workshops are better, like short little things like Tinker Garden and stuff like that. Cause you can just go and try it and do it. And then there's no commitment. You don't have to like keep going back mm -hmm. to the same class. Like, yeah, if they don't feel like it. I mean, kids are like, so in the moment, it's so hard for them to like, they can't plan out, Oh, for the next six weeks, I'm going to be in this class. Like, yeah. right. you know, it is, it's the same with sports. Like I've seen kids sign up for baseball. And then after like a month, they hate it, but they have to keep going because their parents paid a lot of money and they have all these uniforms and like, oh, but you have a team and your team is counting on you. And I don't know, like that just seems like a little too much pressure for a kid. Yeah, I, th I think also so much of the learning process, the natural learning process is about learning what interests you. And a lot of that is experimenting, taking yeah. classes here and finding out that, oh, you know what? I thought I'd be interested in photography or whatever, but it, it turns out it's, I'm not interested in it. And, but like you said, there's the definitely the financial factor, but I, I, at least me, like I've always been open to listening to them. So if they become uninterested, you know, we'll at least take another, a few more courses and see if it still clicks. Uh, but if, if, if it's definitely something that they're absolutely like, oh, why am I doing this right now? Why are you forcing me? Uh, then I, I'm prepared and ready to, to drop it because I see them learning about their interests, you know, by taking these courses and, you know, this is just part of their exper experience, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I don't see, I, I just see these, uh, these, uh, these experiences as part of their learning process. So I'm ready to, <laughs> I'm ready to follow their lead. So I, I think that's part of the, the unschooling, but I definitely understand how it's hard for 
on the parents, especially when there's a lot of money involved and time commitments and things of that nature. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, here, yeah, let's uh, go on to our next question. You know, I probably should have started with this, but can you explain what unschooling is for the, the listeners who have heard this term for the first time? Uh, yeah. I know when I heard of unschooling, I automatically thought, oh, that's unlearning. Like what, they're just not going <laughs> to learn anymore because we associate schooling with learning so much. They're just mm -hmm. intertwined. There's no separation. But can you explain like in basic terms what unschooling is? <laughs> yeah. Um, so unschooling is sort of, it came out of the homeschooling movement. And a lot of times it's associated with, um, uh, why am I blanking on his name? How children learn. Oh, John Holt. Holt. John Holt, yeah. Um, he, I, I think he's kind of considered the father of unschooling. I might be wrong about that, but that's sort of like the earliest, I think it was like the 60s or the 70s mm -hmm. even. I think he coined the term unschooling. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, so he, and I think he had a lot of like just anecdotal observations of his little child learning things on her own without anyone teaching her or telling her and just how superior that is to a traditional like you know schooling where they just kind of try to dump information into a child's brain mm -hmm. um and like this is something that schools have been trying to figure out um for a while in terms of like knowing that the science like the brain science is telling us that children learn best through self-directed play and like exploration and they learn better when they discover it on their own mm -hmm. rather than someone telling them the answer. Right. And the problem is like, we have a performative um, testing based school system. So if you, then you can't just wait for all the kids to figure it out on their own. You have to tell them the answer so that they can repeat it on the test, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this sort of like, um, <clears throat> schooling became sort of like not a place to learn and a, a place to sort of memorize facts and then spit them out mm -hmm. um, as some kind of performative <laughs> thing. <laughs> and like, so unschooling was like a response to that saying like, we're, we're gonna actually learn things and like, you know, our, grow creativity rather than killing creativity. Um, and yeah, but it was also, it's kind of a radical thing. I think the unschooling, it, it sounds kind of radical. And a lot of the early unschoolers were kind of radical, very like, um, you know, counterculture in a lot of ways. So yeah, like, and even homeschooling is more popular now than it ever was before. But like, when I was growing up, homeschoolers were like either weird hippies or Christian, like evangelical Christians or some other kind of religious group that felt like public school was too, um, you know, worldly or something mm -hmm. so it's definitely evolved a lot i think there's a lot of different reasons to homeschool now than ever before but basically unschooling is sort of a a branch of homeschooling that's right. uh, and there's and there's different branches inside unschooling now too yeah there is and unschooling looks so different for every family right some families they'll unschool with everything except math and reading like we're, we're mm -hmm. just going to cover math and reading for sure but then yeah. you have the rest of the day to play and discover your passions and you know some some families are, are the radical unschoolers right um yeah where, hey you get to do whatever you want and you just learn by natural consequences mm -hmm. yeah i mean what what kind of what type of unschooling how does unschooling look like in in your family yeah I mean, right now the kids are little and so they do require a lot of guidance from me. I mean, there's obviously like we, I take them to a forest school program that I co-facilitate and um, that's up to me. Like I didn't ask them if they wanted to go. I just said, yeah, we're doing this. Um, I think as they get older, I'm going to ask for their input a lot more right. and I'm not going to require um, any type of like academic stuff from them. So as far as like academics go, I think I'm a radical unschooler when it comes to like what they eat and whether they shower and brush their teeth and that kind of thing. I'm definitely not a radical unschooler. Yeah, <laughs> there's, there's definitely rules, <laughs> like not, not necessarily rules, but just kind of boundaries around yeah. like, you know, this is just what we do. Like we take care of ourselves and, right. um, yeah, it's just not really, there's no question about that. It's not like I'm just going to let them, you know, go for months without bathing or anything like that. 
<laughs> yeah, when I started, uh, well, actually last, was it that last year or the beginning of this year, I kind of started trying to, trying out radical unschooling. So I, I just tell them, okay, well, oh, it was right around when I was reading conscious, the conscious parenting book too. So yeah, respecting them and, you know, like, okay, try to do your thing. And, but they were going to bed at like midnight, <laughs> uh, which is not natural because with artificial light, you know, it's messing up with their circadian rhythm. So there's a little of that too, you know, like, yeah, respect the child, but also realize that our lives now, you know, we have all this artificial stuff around us that is like kind of messing up their learning. You know, if you just give into the whole idea of, oh yeah, let them do whatever they want. And they would never brush their teeth or they would eat candy all day. So yeah. I'm I mean, I kind of think if like, if we lived off grid, like on some kind of self-sustaining eco village or something, I could totally see being like a radical unschooler and just sort of yeah. letting them do whatever because right. they would just naturally like do whatever everybody else is doing. And yeah. when the sun goes down, there's no light. So we just all go to sleep. Like, yeah. I think that it's very different trying to do that in a modern setting. Like you have to really be conscious about what it means and why you're doing it. You right. know, like, is right. it working for the family? Like. Is it working for the kids? Yeah, like a lack of sleep is not going to be good. Well, yeah. a radical unschooler would tell us, well, they will learn. So lack of, you know, with the lack of sleep, but I just still feel that they're so little that, you know, for them to really grasp that idea, like, oh, I'm yeah. tired because I slept five hours last night. You know, they'll just be cranky. Yeah. And one of the big ideas in the unschooling groups that I'm a part of, like also known as self-directed education is um, there's, there's a lot of focus on consent and part of it is, you know, we as adults and other people living in the home with the kids, we have to consent to being around them if mm -hmm. they're going to, you know, in this like sleep deprived state or um, right. if they're dirty and they smell bad, like, <laughs> you know, we could say like, look, I don't consent to this. So we need to figure something out. There's um, so much of also, you know, parenting is that we're also trying to teach them certain things, you know, I mean, there's, it's, it's, it goes two ways, right? Like we respect them and their passions and their interests and, and, but there's also, you know, that whole part of parenting that we're, we're just trying to show them, you know, that yes, you do need to brush your teeth and, you know, you do, you know, there's certain societal expectations as well. So um, yeah, you can't go running outside naked, you know, <laughs> we have neighbors everywhere. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I just see it as a two way, you know, uh, two-way street I guess uh you know meeting in the middle but you know the consent thing I think that's I think that's really neat in unschooling because I it definitely has forced me to you know allow them to have their own voice as well so when they were little I would take them everywhere and in fact I just posted about this on uh, on social media yesterday it was like the first time in a very long time that my oldest daughter did not want to go with us to the playground mm -hmm. and I think Part of me at first, I was just like taken aback. Like, what do you mean you want to go with us? We go everywhere together. How, what is this hat? Why is this happening? Uh, but then my unschooling mom mind thought, oh, it's her asserting her independence and her voice. And I need to respect that. Yeah, and her dad was home. So it's not like I left her home by herself. But, <laughs> uh, but I thought it was interesting that the whole unschooling way of life kind of shows you, right, mm -hmm. to to just listen to your child more as opposed to just like, nope, it's my way or the highway and mm -hmm. you're going to do what, what we tell you to do. <laughs> there's yeah. a lot of back and forth, right? Yeah, there's definitely more balance. And I think the idea of respect, you know, we, I think you and I probably grew up in homes where like respect means you listen, you do what somebody says. Right. And I think respecting our children doesn't mean that we always do what they say, but it also doesn't, you know, we don't expect them to always do what we say either. There's right. this sort of like, you know, let's find something that works for both of us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, as they get older, I feel like there's more opportunity to explain why and really talk about the needs that are there. Mm -hmm. um, as when they're younger, it's really hard to do this because they, you know, how do you explain to a two-year-old, I'm not gonna let you run in the street because you could die. <laughs> like, yeah. you know. Right. Like, <laughs> so you just sort of have to like risk for me respect for little ones is is respecting where they're at developmentally and and just really holding the boundaries for them 
in a respectful way that's like you're a human being and also you don't understand the things that I know so I'm gonna you know hold these boundaries for you yeah oh that's beautiful I, I love how you how you put it yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think you put it really nicely yeah it's you know respecting where they're at developmentally but still you know showing them the way while they're yeah. young and you know don't know all about all the stuff that we know about you know yeah. with all our years of experience so it's, it's a it's a great balance I, I think and I think it strengthens our bond with them so much because ever since I started to listen more to them and see them as an individual as opposed to my property so, you know someone that I own and I can do whatever I want to because I I'm the authority figure here gosh our relationship just everything just fits so beautifully. And I'm not going to say it's always a walk in the park uh, because, you know, we all bring our own baggage to the picture, right? I mean, I have my baggage and, you know, my things that I have to deal with as a conscious parent, Um, but it just facilitated things so, so much, you know, made things so much easier for us. So yeah, just just the fact that you stop to listen to them, you know, when, when you hear, when you feel that pushback, and, and you stop to listen to them, you know, it, it, it shows them that we see them and we hear them as, mm-hmm. as a person, you know, and I think that's great for them to grow up in like that kind of environment being seen Absolutely. and heard even as yeah. they're little. Mm-hmm. For sure. That's really important. Mm-hmm. Okay. So what's the biggest misperception you find when it comes to unschooling? <laughs> I'm sure you get a lot yeah. of, yeah. Uh, I'm sure you get a lot of comments on Facebook and stuff whenever you mention unschooling like I do. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I think it's more of just a fear that people have when it comes to unschooling. They're they're just really afraid that the kids aren't going to learn anything, that they're just going to run wild, that like they're not going to know how to be in society. Um, There is a lot of fears around homeschooling too. Just like, what about their social life? Like I always get that question and I'm like, what do you mean? Like, (laughs) do you think they're getting a social life in school? You know, Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the John Taylor Gatto, but I, he, I remember he's really influential. He's passed now, but he was like teacher of the year for years in New York city. Um, This is phenomenal teacher and educator, but he quit and he wrote this amazing little essay online. I'm, it had a kind of a clever name, something like why I quit or why I walked away or something um, by John Taylor Gatto. It's available for free. And it's just a phenomenal look at like what has happened to the education system. And he says that school is a 12 year prison sentence. And well, I have for, to a, lot of, <laughs> for a lot of people, experience. yeah, that people hear that. And I, that's the thing I get the most pushback on is in social media anyways. Like I'll post stuff about school being like prison and people will just lash out like, how can you say that? And like, what about our teachers who are working so hard? And I'm like, I get it. Like I, I'm an educator. Like I understand that they're doing their best mm-hmm. with what they have in the system that they have. But I bet you can't find a teacher who will tell you that they actually think the system is working and that it's a good system. Um, they're yeah. just trying to make it work. And, and so for me, I'm like, unschooling is like, you know, the answer. <laughs> It's like, get them out of that system. But at the same time, people are afraid because the system is what they know. They grew up that way. A lot of people went to public school and they're like, well, I turned out fine, you know? And so they think, well, maybe there's something wrong with me if I went to this horrible school system. And then like, you know, they don't want to acknowledge that. Then they also don't want to like take the risk and do something different because they don't know what's going to happen. It's like the fear of the unknown. They're like, what if my kid can't get into college because I unschooled them or, you know, and these are all like kind of valid fears, but also a little bit like unnecessary because if you actually do the research, you find that like college acceptance is higher for kids who are unschooled and homeschooled. Like, Mm -hmm. like the research tells them, Hey, there's nothing to be afraid of, but there's still that fear from, I think the conditioning that we have, you know, from a very early age. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because we can't, we can't separate learning from, from schooling. I mean, just, yeah. you know, I went to school 12 years and uh, yeah, absolutely. For me, it was a prison. I'm absolutely. And I, I feel like adults, a lot of times we forget how it really felt like, you know, we just as adults, like it's not in our present lives anymore. Right. Yeah. So 
uh, we just want to kind of deny it and just say it's the only reality we know for learning. Mm-hmm. So we just say like, no, my kid has to go to school. He'll amount to nothing. And, yeah. you know, I, I gave a talk um, uh, on unschooling last week and I was telling them that I was giving the example of my brother and I, how, yes, we did go to school in the eighties in Brazil. Um, but whenever we came back home, we were free to play. And even if there was any homework, my parents were never on top of us. So we never did any homework. (laughs) I don't remember ever doing homework or ever even writing an essay for the 12 years I was in school. I I tell that to my husband, he thinks it's, it's crazy, but you know, I spent all my time playing outside with kids because in Brazil, like it's a, it's a very youthful uh, population, a young population. So I always had like a gang of friends outside to play with, which is where I learned all my lessons in life, I have to say. And, and then I also spent so much time reading. I was just an avid reader. I would just pick up books because I also wanted to keep up with my English because at the time I was in a, a Portuguese speaking school. Um, but that's where I learned how to write. It was just reading because my obsession to like with reading, you know? And so I went to college thinking like, oh, maybe I'm unprepared compared to the American kids. You know, I went to college here in the States and I, I was more than prepared. You know, my brain was ready at that point from being like a, an average student, you know, maybe even below average, not really caring about school because it felt like a prison to me. It didn't appeal to me. And then I just went and started getting like straight A's because my brain was ready. And that, I think that mm-hmm. happens with a lot of unschooling kids is that when they finally go to college, their brain is more than ready. And even if they aren't prepared for the, you know, the subjects, like maybe they didn't have like a formal math instruction their whole life, but they'll pick it up in like a month or two. So something mm-hmm. that kids had to study for 12 years and been subjected to be in a classroom for 12 years, they'll pick it up in a month or two, like all of that stuff, you know, and, but they also have that inquisitive mind too, that, you know, that just by the way they, they grew up, you know, always inquiring and trying to like figure out stuff about their interests and passions. Right. So they, they take that to the, co- the college classroom. So yeah. it's really interesting reading about unschooling kids in college and their, their perspective on them compared to the the kids who have been through the the system right like intellectually Mm -hmm. like they're so much more engaged in the classroom because they're there because they want to like this is their choice instead of having been going through the system forced to go through the system (laughs) yeah there's a sort of like passivity that I think um, a lot of students have growing up in public school systems, even private school. I don't want to say like private schools are better because they're, they have the same, you know, standards and academically focused stuff. And uh, it's, yeah, the children kind of get used to, oh, you know, the teacher's going to tell me this stuff and I have to remember it and I have to pass a test or write an essay or whatever. And it sort of becomes this kind of rote um, experience that they don't really care about anymore. They're just doing it. Um, out of habit. And so then when they get to college, it's sort of more of the same. And actually, because um, they have more autonomy, a lot of kids don't do well in college that went to public school because they're used to just sort of sitting there and being passive and and they need to be more engaged in -hmm. college because the professor's not going to hold your hand in a 200 class, you know, 200 student class. Um, You don't even have to come. (laughs) And so you know, yeah. it's, it's hard for them to transition into that, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely interesting. Cause I think the assumption is that an unschooling kid will, will never learn how to navigate the real world. Uh, it will never learn how to, you know, navigate college. And, and I got a, a, an interesting comment on uh, Facebook a couple of weeks ago. It was just like, well, you know, when, in, in the real world, we have rules we need to follow. You know, you need to learn how to, where to drive, what kind of lane to drive in, how to walk through a door and, and uh, <laughs> where to go grocery shopping. And, and I was thinking like, well, they're doing that in the real world as unschoolers. I mean, before yeah. COVID, I mean, I would take my kids shopping and, you know, they're, they're out in the real world. So compared compare that to a child who's in a classroom, like, you know, same age, you know, uh, age segregated classrooms in that box for 12 years. I mean, who who is really experiencing the real world here? You know? Yeah. They are not experiencing the real world at all. Um, which is probably why they, they, you know, like unschoolers are more, like you said, in the real world, because that's what we're doing. We're doing real life with them. 
you know? Yeah. I think there's this perception too, that they're, we're protecting them, right. That we're, mm-hmm. we're just keeping them home and they're not experiencing anything when it's really like the exact opposite. Like we want to put, push them out there to see the real world and interact with people of all ages and, and yeah. learn as they go. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think the most fundamental lessons that I've learned in life were through just living life as opposed to studying from a book, you know, yeah. they, they became important when I was ready for it and had meaning for me. Like, yeah. do you consider yourself like you, that you are in schooling as well as a mom? Um, oh, yeah. Living life? Yeah, I, I definitely do. Um, probably now more than I did before when I was still thinking about um, going back to teaching. But yeah, I definitely feel like I'm an unschooler or an unschooling family. Um, it just yeah. seems right. I don't know, like maybe it's not true because because <laughs> a lot of people do formal school when their kids are four and a half turning five. Um, but for me, it just feels like, an, like, why would I call myself an unschooler? I'm just, I just have little kids. Like they're not, of course they're not doing school. Uh-huh. But that's not necessarily true because there's a lot of people that put their kids in school at like age two or three, yeah. you know? Yeah. Starting a lot earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Than used to. Yeah, definitely. So you, you have been unschooling this whole time, which it's funny because it's, you're just living life. I mean, yeah. right. I mean, yeah. you don't even need a term. It's just like, you're just living life, except mm-hmm. when they're older, you just keep going with, with yeah. that dynamic. And it's not like kids stop learning at age five, right? I think that's the assumption is like, oh no, at age five, we got to put them in school because they'll, they'll just stagnate. All yeah. that learning that happened before age five is just going to stop unless we start teaching them, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, it really, it doesn't make any sense. Like in terms of like brain research, it doesn't line up. So I, I always just kind of wonder like, why do people think that? Like <laughs> there's no, there's no evidence to support that at all. Yeah. I think it's because it's, it's all we know, right? I mean, yeah. and it's, it's been such a recent experiment in uh, human history. It's been, I think it was, I have the date here. It's like um, 18, 1892 was That's when- school, compulsory schooling. Compulsory, yeah. yeah, 1892. Mm-hmm. I mean, think of like uh, the entire, our entire human history, right? Like- yeah, that's like not even a blink of an eye. It's just, this is, so unschooling seems radical, but what's, what really is radical from an, an evolutionary perspective, looking at our entire history, mm-hmm. it really is schooling. Schooling is the radical, um, yeah. the, the radical uh, structure here, you know, because we're just doing what we, what humans used to do with their entire lives. I mean, for, exactly. for our entire evolution. So exactly. Yeah. I mean, Peter Gray talks about that in his book, Free to Learn, yeah. which is like the unschoolers Bible, you know? <laughs> oh my gosh. Like, I, I keep going back to that book over and over whenever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let, let's talk a little bit about de-schooling too, because like whenever I start having, cause that's something that pops up right with every unschooling family, because we've been yeah. so conditioned to think that, you know, learning only happens academically. Uh, yeah. So, you know, even though, even you can be like passionate about unschooling, but it'll just pop up here and there, especially mm-hmm. when our kids start entering like school age, you know, I found that my oldest is now six and a half. So technically in first grade, you know, so I started mm-hmm. enrolling her in like math and reading here, you know, so that yeah. let's talk about like de-schooling. I mean, can you explain that to, to the, to the listener? <laughs> what yeah. I mean, how- there's two, there's two parts of de-schooling. One is like the parents de-schooling and the other part is the kids. So sometimes you have kids who were in school, like in a traditional school setting, and then the parents find unschooling and they want, they want it to, you know, switch over. And so they say, Hey, let's switch over to unschooling. Of course, the kid is excited at first. Um, but there is this sort of de-schooling process. And for, for kids, what that sometimes looks like is it looks like all learning stops and the kid just wants to be on a screen for like months and they just do nothing. Mm-hmm. Quote unquote. Nothing, you're right. Mm-hmm. Um, and what that is, is sort of like, they just need to like totally um, reset. And a lot of times that's kind of scary for parents watching their kid go through that. Cause they're like, wait, did we make a mistake? Like maybe we should have just kept them in school. Like what's happening here. And uh, eventually the child will kind of pull out of that and find something that they're interested in and start learning, you know, whatever it is that they want to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of times being in some type of uh, co-op or like a setting like that can help the parents a little bit, <laughs> like mm-hmm. feel like, okay, my kid is still doing something yeah. um, that they want to 
you not like on a screen all the time. Um, yeah, but that's, so that's for like, from a kid's perspective for, for us parents who started out doing this, um, the de-schooling is just like every day, our own conditioning, like thinking, why am I doing this? Like, why do I feel like sometimes we want to help or we want to push or we want to suggest something or like give our kids some piece of knowledge that we think they really need to know yeah (laughs) because it's been conditioned that like oh when they're this age they need to learn this or you know there's just all kinds of like pressures oh my kid isn't reading and they're six or they're seven and they're not reading yet and there's just a lot of like um yeah this pressure that comes from these expectations we have from yeah from conditioning because in other cultures I mean, I think Finland and maybe Denmark, kids don't learn to read till they're seven. So that's like considered normal. But where, where we are, it's considered, you know, age five is when kids learn how to read. And so if they're not, they're behind or they need some kind of IEP or they have a delay or whatever. Yeah. And yeah. We're so quick to like label those things. Yeah. There's so Which much I, pressure. I sad. Yeah. 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 Like pathologizing, you know, someone just because they don't fit the, that artificial timeline right yeah. pathologizing their condition or whatever but it just could mean that they're just not ready for it this mm-hmm. year but next year they'll just take off exactly yeah I think a lot of it has to do too with you know just in mainstream parenting for so long for so many centuries it's all been about control right I mean mm-hmm. controlling your child like you know I have to control how your life is going to be and where, where you're going to end up at. And it's so much based on fear, like just fear. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's just guiding your, to think that you're, that's what's guiding your relationship with your child. I mean, you got to right. really step back and kind of examine these things. That's where conscious parenting fits in with unschooling. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. Training. I really like how they intersect in that way. Just like really thinking about, you know, what's happening here. Like, why am I doing this? the way that I am doing, you know, why am I parenting this way? And is it, is it beneficial for my child? And is it beneficial for me? You know, so just like raising that awareness is really important. And, and yeah, thinking about like, I don't know, I never thought about like the trajectory of my child's life. Like I didn't really think about that. Um, When in Shafali's books, when she talks about, you know, this whole vision of like my child becoming a doctor or whatever, and like the sort of pressure or, you know, enrolling your two-year-old in like ballet lessons because, you know, they might become some famous person. That was never a thing for me. I just, um, I never related to that kind of parenting. Um, And I don't know why, I don't know if it's because I just wasn't raised that way or. Mm. Yeah, I think um, me me too. Yeah. I was just more, more concerned with like, um, I, I think I'm more concerned with like morality, like making sure that they're good people and that they're kind. So I think a lot of times my reaction to my kids is more like, oh my gosh, my kid is like hitting someone and like, are they going to be a bad person? (laughs) And, you know, that's all just like, I think my, my education has helped me with that. Just like developmentally, it's totally normal for two-year-olds to like go around and hit people. Uh And like for my son, when he was like 28 months old and my daughter's like six months old and she's like sitting up kind of like barely holding herself up and he'll come over and like just push her down and she'll fall back and start crying and he's like laughing I'm like oh my god my child is a monster (laughs) but like you know you you know we want to like react and like try to control and try to change our kids and it's like no this is just development you know this is developmental the solution is don't let your kid in the same space as your six month old <laughs> like yeah right I created like a safe space for my baby yeah. to like be so if I wasn't holding her she was in there and he was not allowed in there with her because he was not safe for her <laughs> you know yeah, right. and that was okay like I didn't try to change him I didn't say I didn't shame him and say like you're a bad big brother or anything like that because yeah. I'm like that's not gonna help he can't help it this is this is what he's going through he's just right. like oh there's this baby let me see what happens if I push on it like yeah you know they don't (laughs) they don't have the it's so important to understand how brain development in children I feel like that should be like required I mean in your experience you know with your master's degree you know in your training did, did they do they talk about that I mean 
do they talk about yeah. like brain development and things like that? So, so the teachers go into the system knowing all, all these things, right? Kind of. So for elementary ed, I think I took a human development class. So that was like birth to death, you know, just like a full, so you didn't get like in detail with the child development. Um, I got more information when I was in Waldorf and I was studying about like Rudolf Steiner and what he, the way he viewed the first seven years. Mm -hmm. And then um, in definitely in early childhood, you learn about child development, specifically like Piaget and Vygotsky and those guys um, so from a psychological perspective, like what's happening for kids and what are they aware of? What are they not aware of? And like, mm -hmm. because when you're assessing children or you're like, you know, judging them or like trying to figure out what's going on in their brain um, it's good to have a baseline to know like what is typical for children this age like what's there and so there's certain activities you can do to like determine mm -hmm. <laughs> where they're at and you know it's like obviously there's kind of a spectrum of development it's not like every kid at age three is gonna have these things that they're doing or mm -hmm. um, but but it's it's nice to know kind of a general baseline yeah of like okay th my child is I have parents all the time ask me about empathy like when do kids develop empathy and I'm like well I mean technically like abstract empathy where you can like in your head get out of your body and picture what the other person is going through and like actually understand that the other person is different from you that's like age nine like we're talking nine ten eleven that oh. doesn't happen for early childhood like they might feel some sympathy or be like, oh, that person is sad. And I know what it's like to feel sad. And so they could have some level of like, you know, understanding, like, how do I respond when somebody's sad? Oh, I could give them a hug or I could, but I've seen kids like try to force hugs on somebody who's sad because they're, they're yeah. like this conditioned response, like, oh, I'm going to give you a hug. And the kid does not want to hug. And they're just like, let me hug you. <laughs> and like, that's not really empathy. That's just sort of like a, a, a learned behavior that's yeah. like oh when someone's sad <laughs> yeah <laughs> so yeah there's just different and it's not to say that like little kids are like don't have any kind of empathy it's it's not as cut and dry as that it's just like you can't expect them to understand what other people are going yeah. through you just yeah. can't you know? I know. Yeah. And I, I just started to understand my kids so much more when I start reading more about brain development. And yeah, I mean, this whole talk about like, oh, they babies need to learn how to self soothe. And you know, they're that part of the brain isn't even developed yet. Yeah. I think I think it only develops at around age five or so. So mm -hmm. there's just like so much out there. Like, yeah. when you start reading the science, you know, and then you compare that to mainstream culture or mainstream parenting, you just see that there's just, yeah. there's a huge disconnect. So yeah, yeah, I mean, I encourage every parent out there to at least read like an essay on brain development for your child, because you will understand them so much more and you will empathize with them more. So then you're showing mm -hmm. them, you know, you're, you're teaching them about empathy too, along the way, right? Because if we don't want to empathize yeah. with our children, how are they going to learn about empathy, right? Yeah. Yeah, kids learn through imitation, like 100% from age zero to seven, they're learning from imitation. And it's not just like physical acts, like, okay, I'm sweeping the floor. So my kid starts sweeping the floor the way that I do. It's like the, the way that I behave, the way that I speak to others, the way that I, the attitudes that I have, you know, like my kids are literally, you know, taking all that in. I mean, Maria Montessori was right when she said, kids have this absorbent mind, like they're just like a sponge and they just like soak everything in. To their subconscious so you know it's it, it's like they're being programmed like a computer yeah and you know after age seven that kind of programming stops because they become um they go from like theta wave um brain wave to like alpha i think is the higher i'm trying to think which one's lower i think delta is like the sleeping wave and alpha is the uh, awake one okay. and so kids are kind of zero to seven they're in this theta state of like Kind of hypnosis state or like dreamlike state which is why they're so in the present moment like they're not planning out all these next steps or like thinking about the past they're mm -hmm. just like right here and yeah. they're also kind of here but like in this dreamy you know so yeah. a lot of times when i'm like talking to my kids and they're sort of not hearing me <laughs> i'm like come on why can't you hear what i'm saying to you and it's like or, you have or to or when you, you're you're in the middle of saying something profound and you think it's clicking in, in their heads and then they just go like, 
okay, mommy, when, when's the next time, when, when are we going to eat a snack? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah like, that went like <laughs> right over. Yeah. Right yeah. Over. <laughs> so, and it's, a, it is exhausting. I can see why parents are, you know, it's hard for parents. Like you were saying, I wish they would read the articles. It's like we could read all the articles we want and we can understand like kids can't self-soothe until they're five. But like, if we're the only ones available to soothe them, like as a mom, the, and like our husband's always working and we don't have any help at home, maybe we have other kids, we're going to give them that pacifier and turn on some kind of exactly. music because like right. we can't do it. We can't do everything. Right. Yeah. That, yeah. that is, yeah. I think you just touched on a very important uh, issue there that, you know, that's why parenting is so hard these days because we're just doing it all by ourselves and it's not how our species were designed to be mm-hmm. like we're supposed to have a no kidding tribe around us like you're supposed yeah. to open the door and your kid is supposed to go outside and play with you know a nine-year-old and a 10-year-old and a three-year-old and they're just like learning from each other so yeah in a way in schooling you know we're, we're trying to do our best right to try to replicate that environment but you know our modern yeah. day lives you know we're just trying to do our best to kind of get as close as possible to the natural way but we have to also understand that modern day the modern day life like also imposes some limitations too but i, yeah, I still I think, think it's better than uh yeah the alternative traditional school yeah. yeah i think that unschooling would definitely like the best possible unschooling would be in like an eco village or like some kind of sustainable community um where you know the people are all supporting each other and doing just doing life together because yeah. that's just the most natural way it's yeah. definitely harder to do it as like this isolated nuclear family structure. Like it's not how it is designed at all. It's not, yeah. So if you feel like you're failing, it's really not your fault. I think it's the, it's just the system that we're in, you know? So we just have to find ways to, you know, find your community, find moms to to hang out with and other kids and let your kid play. I think that's the most important message I learned from Peter Gray, uh, free to learn is just let your kid play your kid needs that. It's not, it's not a waste of time. Like developmentally he needs to be, he or she needs to be, you know, playing in a, in a self-directed way. No adults like organizing everything. Cause that's what we do so much these days, right? So everything is like adult led. Mm-hmm. We rarely let them just play and be there on their own without us like interjecting and interfering and trying to control the dynamics right so yeah. keep peace uh, missing from their learning experience Absolutely. <laughs> well i think we're running out of time here i, I could talk to with you for like all day i feel because we're both <laughs> so passionate about unschooling right i mean it's so nice to have another mom that we can just chat back and forth and and relate to and have similar experiences and mindset. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks so much for joining us. Do you have any uh, final thoughts you'd like to add? Um, how can people reach you? I mean, things like that. Yeah. I mean, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, you know, like, I don't know if you want to link people to that stuff. Yeah. Um, I am working on like a website to help parents um, who want to homeschool or unschool, but they just don't know what to do and they want guidance. So like, I'm working on that. Um, yeah, I would just say like, (laughs) read Peter Gray, read John Holt, like read John Taylor Gatto, Sir Ken Robinson, he passed away this year. Um, yeah, there's so many resources out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely Peter Gray. I always tell everyone like, even Mm -hmm. if you want to send your kid to school and you want to do a more traditional homeschooling, you know, or, you know, teaching environment for your kids, but you got to read Peter Gray because I think it'll just relax you. He he just comes, it's loaded with, you know, all the science and the history uh, behind play and how children naturally learn. So it'll at least like give you a broader perspective of the natural ways of children learning. So your kid is not wasting their time, yeah. you know, if they're just playing. They absolutely are not. Yeah. <laughs> I would argue they're learning a, a lot more yeah, absolutely. Uh, other than otherwise. Well, cool. I'll let you go, Rachel. Thanks Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, (laughs) Bianca. This is great. Have a good one. You too. Bye. Bye.